Feet, I'm really sorry, you were just having a whale of a time with two ladies. <laughs> one that had, she was big, big. the other one was slim. You've got to love large breasts, don't you? I do. <laughs> it's England. They were know? giving you a hard time. No, they, not really. Well, they're, they're going to be giving me a much harder time during the show. <laughs> right. Uh, there, uh, there are dominatrixes. Or is it dominatri? Or dominatrices. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, uh, which we got here in, in, uh, in England to do the... For you! We got it for you, for the DVD. You know, because the rest of the guys are all married and their wives won't let them have dominatrixes. <laughs> dominatrices in their, you know, in the show. Welcome I'm to Shepherd's kidding. Bush Empire. you played this place several times before. Great shows you've yeah. played. Tell us about the Wild West show. How did that come together? Uh, well, you know, we're from the Wild West. We really are. Uh, we all grew up in Arizona. And, Phoenix, uh, yeah. Phoenix. I actually grew up in Scottsdale, but it was such, back then it was such a small town that you know it might as well have been Phoenix. There was nothing there to do. You had to go to Phoenix to do anything, right. and that's and going to the rock clubs in Phoenix is where I met all the guys when we were right. you know high schoolers, right. so back in the '60s. And uh, what kind of music were they playing for you? Psychedelic kind of you know. Roger loves Jimi Hendrix. Back Roger used to have a trio called the Red, White, and Blues Band. Right. And he did the whacked out Jimi Hendrix and all these original kind of psychedelic type songs right and uh another band was the beans yeah and the other band was was the beans which was a D bills band and uh uh they were individual two separate bands just working a bunch and back then there wasn't i mean when we first knew each other there was you know roger's band was called something else bill's band was something else i mean there's four names since then uh when you but, met bill sputnik spooner what was your first impression of this guy uh, he was, you know, he was a nice guy. I mean, he was, he was, he was very cool. He was, uh, he was kind of famous in, in our little circle because he had been in a lot of bands and he was a lead guitar player and he was really good. And same with Roger. Roger was also kind of, you know, an a, a important local guitarist. And, and of course, Prairie was, you know, the best drummer in town even back when he was 18 years old. And, uh, and, uh, but it, back then, you know, you could get, away, I mean, Phoenix, back in those days in the 60s, Phoenix was like an isolated market. They used to test products right. on us right. because we didn't have any influence. You know, we weren't California. We were, yeah. it, you know, back then 400 miles from California seemed like a, e ages, you know, right. eons away. Right. And we didn't have Eastern influence. You know, it was this little podunk town out in the middle of nowhere, and like one of the first McDonald's was there. You know, they tried out fast food. So it was a test marketing place. It was a test marketing place. They tried out uh, trampoline parks where they would take a big parking lot and cut holes in the asphalt and string a trampoline net across it. I mean, it lasted 10 minutes. You know, people would bounce up and down and bam, off onto the concrete, break their arm, break their leg, sue the company, you know. That didn't last long. Super Slide. Remember Super Slide? It was like a great big plastic slide that was like 50 feet high. And you'd get up on top of it and they'd give you a burlap bag, kind of like my cowhide here. And you'd sit on the burlap bag and you'd slide down this thing. Well, half the time the bag would slide out, you'd get a friction burn on your arm that burned all the way down to the <laughs> bone, you know. And so that was a big liability thing. So that never happened. And, uh, so you, they used to try all these things, and so we were kind of guinea pigs, you know. Right. Same thing right. with television. It was so hot there that people didn't go outside much in the summer. You stayed inside and you watched TV. You know, right. you watch westerns on TV. I grew up watching westerns. And did you and feel very much in the Wild West? Was that the thing? You felt isolated from, from what was going on? Well, we didn't know. I mean, we didn't realize how isolated we were. That was all we were used to. You know, my family moved from Omaha, Nebraska, right. and we had horses. My dad uh, had a horse ranch in Nebraska, and he had a, uh, parade horses. He had grand champion parade horses with the silver saddle and the whole thing, and he would do these gated, gated uh, parade classes. And our, our horse, my dad's horse, his name was King Midas. He was grand champion of 17 states, parade, parade grand champion, seven, big Palomino horse, that's why he was called 
King Midas. Right. Uh, and so when we thought you were actually thinking of being a vet, weren't you? I was for a long time, except I just, I, I, I couldn't, I actually looked into, uh, not too long ago, when I quit the band in 86, I looked into going to vet school. Really? And uh, yeah, there's a number of good ones in California. Number one, it's very hard to get in. Number two, you have to have completed your college education. And I, you know, I dropped out when I was a junior to, to take off to San Francisco with the band. Right. So by the time, and, and it had been so long that it, it turns out that I would have, I still may do it. I would have to go on back to college all over again, start from scratch. All the classes had been so long that you couldn't transfer them. So it would take me seven years right. to be a vet. But I'm, I'm so, I, I couldn't handle it. I mean, I, I can't stand to see animals hurt. I freak right. out. Right. You know, I mean, I, my, one of my little dogs got killed jumped out of the car window and got hit by a car and got killed, and I flipped out. Right. I mean, I was more upset than when my dad died. Right. I mean, my dad and I were, you know, had problems our whole life, and you know, right. and we finally did recon reconcile as I grew up. You know, he thought I was crazy to be a rock and roller, and, yeah. and it took a long time until about the fourth or fifth album we did before he finally said, oh, okay, I get it, you know, you're, you're, in the you're a singer, you're serious, about you're serious about this, he'd come to see the show, you're a great performer, we love the band, and right. we kind of all reconciled again, and then he got cancer in 1991, and he died, and, and, uh, and I was very upset, and, but man, when my dog got killed, I lost it completely, I mean, I was this close to ending it all, I couldn't, and if I had, how long did this last, this feeling? Grief, grief. Oh, God. It was horrible. I had I went to grief counseling. I bought all the books, pet grief and all this stuff. I went to see this psychiatrist about it because I wanted to commit suicide. I was I felt it was my fault yeah. that I didn't have the back window in oh, my right. car rolled up all the way. Right. And you know, my little dog Minnie saw a squirrel and jumped out after it. We were on the way to the park to walk. Fortunately, I had two dogs. I had they were I had sisters, Minnie and Mona. And I still had Mona, I had Mona, you know, and in yeah. the end they said, you know, the, the counselor said, well, what are you going to do? Who's right. going to take care of Mona if you kill yourself? Right. What are you going to do? Right. And I just went, yeah, that, that'd be, that's not good. So I can't that originally you, you didn't become a vet originally because the grief and the, the heartache of seeing animals. I couldn't deal yeah, with it. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. deal with, you know, some animal coming in, getting hit by a car all sliced up yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and I couldn't handle it. I just didn't, I couldn't turn off the emotion. Yeah. I'm a fucking Italian, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I think the best combination is I'm half English and I'm half Italian. Your, your, your dad's from Brighton. My dad's they? from Bristol. Bristol. No, Brighton. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Brighton, I'm sorry. Yeah. We're playing Bristol. My dad was from Brighton. Right. And his whole family was. Yeah. And uh, so I, I love the irony and the sarcasm and the dry humor of the English. You feel at home here? Yeah. I do. I feel at home. I mean, Monty Python was our icons for right. years. In fact, tonight I'm doing a... Where's my Navi hat? That's not it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here it is. Whoa. Right, <laughs> which was a John Cleese yeah. character, you know, yeah. from whatever, a hundred years ago, from yeah. Python, and so, you know, I'm. And, you and my drama, didn't you? Famous? Oh yeah, I was a yeah. drama major. And my mother is Italian, her whole Sicilian. My whole her whole, whole side is from Sicily. All right. And so I've got the passion of the Sicilian, but at the same time, I have the humor and the sarcasm and the irony of the British. So it's right. great for me. I love it. You know. So but, when did John Waldo become Fee Waybill? Well, uh, in the beginning, I, I didn't use Waybill. You know, before we got an album deal, I used to be Feige Cranston. I don't know why. Uh, I don't know why I picked Cranston. I don't know why. There was a senator, I, I think, uh, something, somehow I, I, someone thought I was Alan Cranston's son, and I got in free somewhere, you know, because he was a big senator from California. Right. And, uh, and I thought, oh, this is good. I could go around pretending to be the senator's son and get a lot of perks, you know. Yeah. But then when, uh, and, and Fee came from Fiji, one of the guys in the band saw a cover of a National Geographic magazine. And the co on the cover was the King of Fiji, for some reason. This was back in the 70s, right? right. And uh, they thought I looked just like him. 
the king of Fiji, who's like a black guy with afro out to here, you know. What I just went, what, what, what kind of, well, you're all on drugs. So I said, what kind of drugs are you well, What kind of drugs weren't you on, you know? And, uh, and so they started calling me Fiji. Right. So it was Fiji Cranston. <laughs> what? And so uh, that kind of got shortened down to Fiji. You know how nicknames are. Yeah. So Rick still call Rick the bass player still calls me Feige, wow. and so I was Feige Cranston. And then finally, uh, uh, we got a deal to make a record, and it was time to put your name on the album. You know, and I thought, oh gosh, you know, my dad hates me already. If I don't put my real name on the album, I'll never be able to reconcile with him. So I dumped Cranston, and I cut Feige, and a waybill. A waybill is a like a uh, an invoice, right. you know, FedEx, yeah, 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 an yeah, airway yeah, bill. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's like a list of junk in the back of your big truck, right. you know. Right. And uh, so I, I took the J. It was F E E J I, which is wrong. Right. And so I cut the I, I cut it off, and, and I, I figured, oh, this is this is kind of like terry cloth or right. something. And fee the fee for the way bill kind of right. it all seemed to fit somehow. So. And so the I, tubes, how about the tubes, that name coming together, how did that come together? Uh, actually, we, when we first got together, uh, we, you know, we all moved to San Francisco. First, I was a roadie. I started as Roger's roadie, right. okay, because I, I, I was a hippie and I moved away. I moved out of Phoenix and when I dropped out of college. I moved away to the northern Arizona to be a cowboy. I, well, not to be a cowboy, but I moved away to be a hippie and we lived in this this uh, kind of a commune. It was an abandoned mining town called Jerome. It was a ghost town. And the whole town was full of these little cardboard shacks, wood shacks. Last picture show scene. Yeah. Right, that yeah. where the miners, and it was up on the side of a mountain called Mingus Mountain up right. in northern Arizona. And uh, we all lived in these, all the, about 25 of us just left Phoenix, left everything behind, and we moved to Jerome. And we had nothing. We had no money we would have to go around to collect money to buy a 25 pound bag of brown rice from the store down in Cottonwood. Right. And we all lived on brown rice for years, you know. I'm not years, months. I, I couldn't handle it very long. I remember, I still remember for like a week, I had eight cents in my pocket and that was it. I'll never forget it. I was walking around going, man, I am, I got eight cents. <laughs> this is a joke, this is ridiculous, you know, I'm going nowhere. And uh, I finally couldn't handle it anymore, and I went to work for a cowboy, a local cowboy, because I grew up on a horse. I mean, you know, we had, when I moved, first moved to Scottsdale, we brought a lot of horses with us from Nebraska. And when I was a kid, I used to ride around town on my horse instead of a bicycle. And they still had hitching posts in the late 50s in Scottsdale. You could go to the movies on Saturday morning and see a Western and leave your horse tied up to the hitching post outside. And so, you know, up until the time that rock and roll and girls became more important to me around 13 or 14. I mean, you know, when I was 14, the Beatles hit. Right. I mean, that changed my life. I wanted to be a singer. I wanted to be in rock and roll. You know, the Beatles changed it all for me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I kind of said, okay, well, I'm done with horses now. You know, I want to be a rock singer. And in my first year of, of high school, you know, I was trying to be in a band. I was taking singing classes and Wanted to be in a band. You know? What was the first Beatles single that really hit you? I don't know. I want to hold your hand, I guess. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, I flipped out when the Beatles happened. I flipped out. I loved them. I sang all day long, singing Beatles songs. I sang. And I was really into music. I mean, I had, I had all these old... My first single was Fats Domino, Blue, Blueberry Hill, and, which I still have. And... Uh, so I had a lot of music and I loved to sing and my mother was a singer. My mother used to sing in big bands back when she lived in Omaha before she got married to my dad. Big bands like, you know, Tex Beneke or, or Duke Ellington or big traveling bands. They would travel around without a singer and in each town they would pick up a local singer and it was all standards. You know, you just say, well, do you know, you know, whatever, Begin the Begin or whatever, yeah. some standard tune. Yeah. And my mom was a great singer. She used to do that. That's where I got my voice was from and my mom. And when do you remember getting the, the vision for the tubes, this theatrical well, I, show? Well, I, you know, I was a drama major 
and I had done all these plays in high school. I did, you know, I did Little Abner when I was this big around. I was a little skinny kid with no arms, no nothing, and the guy cast me as Little Abner in the play, right? And I kept waiting for them to make a, a big bulky muscle suit for me to wear, you know, so I'd look like Joseph Little Abner, Lester. you know? And oh no, and the director went, oh no, 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 we're not making you any suit, you just have to think strong, you know? When Pappy Yoakum jumps off the roof into your arms, you better be thinking really strong, because you can't drop it, you know? And so I had always been into theater, and, uh, uh, and they asked, Roger and Prairie asked me to move to San Francisco with them. Prairie got a scholarship to the San Francisco Art Institute, and they decided in 1969 to move to San Francisco. And I was living up in the desert, up in the mountains, and they used to drive up, Roger and Prairie and their bass player, they used to drive up to Cottonwood, set their stuff up, with a generator in the middle of nowhere and just play to the desert. Just nobody, just me and a couple of other guys that lived up there, hippies, and we just, they just play out in the middle of the, just to the world in right. the desert. Right. I thought it was so great. And, uh, and that's and, how the idea started coming together? Well, they asked me to come with them. They said, well, we're moving to San Francisco. And one of the guys in the band said, actually, they didn't say come and be our roadie and hump our stuff, hump our <laughs> shit and make food for us and be the truck driver. No, they said, we want you to play logs. They wanted to get into an African thing and they wanted me to play logs, like hollow African logs with a slot in them. And I didn't, well, I'm, not, I'm not a drummer. I, oh, yeah, 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 we want you to, I never saw a log. Never, <laughs> logs never showed up, ever. And I just ended up, I said, okay, well, I want it out. I had been working for this cowboy. I was a vegetarian. Did you not like the Bay Area and the whole San Francisco scene once you got there? Oh, I loved it. But I mean, I, I, I wanted out of Cottonwood. I was, I was cutting off balls from cows. <laughs> and I'm a vegetarian and I'm cutting balls off and the cow and the ranchers eats them. Mountain oysters, we call them. He fries them up and eats them. Here, come on, go on and taste one. I'm like, no, 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 no. Go ahead, taste. No, no, I'm a vegetarian. I want to be a vet. No, 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 no. Yeah, I want to be a vet. And so they said, we're leaving. We're moving to San Francisco. Prairie's going to school. We don't want to break up the band. We're following him. You want to come along? I said, okay. So I yeah. moved to San Francisco with them, and I humped this gear, and I drove the truck, and I made Cheese Lake, which was my specialty when I was a cook, Cheese Lake, which is like a big old tortilla with, with cheese all over it. Basically it was a tortilla and cheese and that's it. When we did were they poor, start listening to your theatrical input ideas? Well yeah, you know, I, I, uh, when, when the tube, the tubes were originally two separate bands, Bill's band and Roger's band, yeah. that merged together. Right. And uh, when we merged together, because you know, neither one of, we were both starving, neither one of us could support ourselves. And so the managers, which were some other guys that went to high school with us, you know, not professionals, they went, well, you know, we've got some gigs, you've got some, let's do them all together. We'll have twice as many gigs, you know. So we combined <laughs> the two bands. Right. And, uh, and when we did that, Bill's band already had five roadies. They had all right. these guys living at their house being roadies. Right. I said, well, what am I going to do? I, they went, well, we don't need any roadies. And, and uh, they said, well, how about being a singer? You want to, you want to, and I said, well, I can sing. I've been singing all the way through high school and college. I can sing. And so they made me the background singer. Right. And they said, oh, but you got to wear something wacky. You know, you can't just stand there and sing. You got to wear something dumb, some stupid outfit. We started, we started, uh, Roger and Prairie and I came out as the radar men from Uranus. And we wore Mylar space suits. And that was like, Bill would play, because they didn't know enough songs to play a whole show together. So Bill would play some songs, and then he'd go, I'd like to introduce the Radar Men from Uranus. <laughs> and the Radar Men would come out, and Prairie would play. We had two drummers, and Roger would two guitar players. And I would stand in the back and be the, the background singer. Well, I sang so loud that finally they said, look, this is ridiculous. You, you can't sing so loud. And I'm playing all these maracas and various kinds of you know, percussion instruments. And they said, you sing too loud. Why don't you, why don't you come sing lead vocal? I said, oh, okay. Well, what? And so they didn't really, you know, they, in the beginning they didn't want me to sing, they were kind of protective. They didn't yeah. want me to sing their original material, right. Roger's tunes or Bill's tunes. And they said, oh, we'll do a, uh, 
you know, we'll do a, a medley. We'll, we did some cover songs. Well, you can come up, we'll do a medley of James Brown songs, and you can be a Mexican disco singer called Jesus Bongo. That was my first character, Jesus Bongo. Right. Who were, actually, were, uh, oh, where's my hat? That reminds me. I'm, miss, I'm missing my, my mariachi hat. Someone. So they, they would think of all these characters, like Dr. Strange no, no. Kiss, was that their idea No, well? no, or well, we all came up with stuff. We all right. sat down together and, I mean, once I started doing characters and outfits, I did the cowboy, I did Cowboy Fee from the very beginning. We used to do El Paso. Right. And then I did Jesus Bongo and we did all these characters and they, and they, and it became, pop. kids loved it, you know. Yeah. The band would play their original songs and the people would just stand there. And then I would come up and I'd do the James Brown medley and El Paso and all these outfits and they go, yeah, this is great, the guy's great. Yeah. And so they, we started getting more and more into it, right. you know, and getting more and more into, uh, you know, doing the, the visuals and, and building the show up. And I mean, our first, we, we got signed to a record deal on the strength of a video. Right. We didn't send yeah. audio tape cassettes out like everybody yeah. else. Yeah. We sent a video to all yeah. the record companies of us doing the show with you know, me being Quaalude back then with, with little dinky shoes, little yeah. dinky platforms, not, the, not my giant platforms that I made from the bondage catalog. Uh, and so I just kept doing more and more and more and we kept, and, and, and then we, we finally, you know, we, we saw these, uh, uh, we saw this comedy troupe of strippers called Leela and the Snakes. And there was these four girls, and they would do this kind of comedy bit. And on the side, there were strippers on Broadway so you know, you in in San Francisco. So we hired them to be in the band. A quick sort of so. review over the 20 years that, that, that were like the A&M years and the Capital years. Which were your favorite? Which were your favorite, Fee? Well, personally, I think the best producer we ever worked with was David Foster. Right. And in the beginning, we were a wacky cult band, you know, and everything, oh, they're cool, they're yeah. a cult band. Well, cult kind of translates as not very popular, right. not selling any records, not a hit, you know. And when no we money. <laughs> yeah, no money. <laughs> and uh, when we, I think originally they signed us to A&M because Jerry Moss, the, the, the M, yeah. it was Herb Alpert and Jerry yeah. Moss yeah. back then. Well, Jerry thought we were cool. We were like the cool, he signed us because it was cool. Everybody, you know, everybody else had passed on the tubes. And he signed us because he thought we were cool. And after five albums that didn't sell very well, the coolness kind of wore off, you know? Right. We used a different producer every time. Uh, I mean, we, had, we made a couple of great albums at A&M. The yeah. first album with yeah. Al Cooper was great. Yeah. And the Young and Rich album uh, yeah. with, with, uh, uh, Todd Rundgren. No, Young and Rich was Scott, uh, the guy that did the Beatles. God, I can't remember his name. Cut this part out. Uh, uh, shit, I can't remember his name. Anyway, it was the second album was, yeah. was pretty good, and then the third album was a disaster. Right. Fourth album was a live album, and that was pretty good, a live double album from London. Yeah. You know, our, our manager, Ricky yeah. Farr, made us come to England. He goes, oh, you guys got to do this theatrical thing in England. They're going right. to love this. Yeah. And so we came and we played Hammersmith Odeon for eight nights in a row. Right. And we did the What Do You Want From Live live album here. And, uh, but it didn't do all that well. Pete and Henderson Your, your favorite that. album from the Capitol years? The fa my favorite album is Completion Backward Principle, which was the first album on Capitol, the first album we did with David Foster. After, after all that, after five albums on A&M, they said, well, yeah, you're, you're cute and you're kind of our pet cool band, but after we were, you know, about $2 million in the red from never selling records and keep taking tour support to support the big massive show, yeah. you know, they finally went, okay, that's enough. We're, di we're tired of being cool. Right. You know, you're right. out of here. Right. And, and we had to kind of change our, our plan because Capitol, the, the A&R guy at Capitol Records, Bobby Columbia, you know, they he goes, look, you know, you've had five records, you haven't sold any records. I mean, that you're really cool and everybody thinks you're cool, but we're not going to sign you to yeah. sell no records. Yeah. You, you know, we, you got to, you know, if you want to be on Capitol, if you want to continue your career, yeah. Ken Scott right. did our second album, yeah. Englishman. Yeah. 
Ken Scott, worked with the Beatles and George Martin. Uh, he says, you've got to have some hits. Yeah. You've got to get on the radio. Yeah. You've got to get a producer who can change these wacky psycho tunes into something Were you that happy about that? people understand. Well, I was because, you know, I, brought, I was brought up on the Beatles. You know, I loved all those songs. I loved all those songs that resolved in the end. And yeah, it was yeah. great vocals. And, yeah. and, and you know, and, the, and some of the other guys, you know, they wanted to be weird and play songs in keys that nobody yeah. else played in. And, and I times that, that nobody else played in. That was the reason you split in the end, wasn't it? Because there was the commercial part of the tubes and there was... Well, the yeah. Well, it was... It was that was a that was a you know that was a big point of contention for us because you know some of the guys didn't like Foster and you know thought that you know oh we don't want to be a hit yeah well, what are you I said, what are you talking about you know we've been in this business for ten years you don't want to ever make some money or ever con you know I wanted to continue in the business yeah. nobody wanted to sign us yeah. So I love David Foster, and we made two great albums with David Foster, and we had two big hits, three big hits actually, with David yeah. Foster. And uh, and then when it got to making the last, the next album, uh, you know, they they a couple of the guys led the charge. You know, I don't want to name names, but they're not in the band anymore. Right, right. You won't be seeing them tonight. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, you know, they, 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 they didn't want to use David. Right. They went say, you know, no, we don't need him. You know, he's, we want to do our own thing and be weird and, you know, blah, 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 and do our own out, produce ourselves. And Todd kind of, Todd Rundgren agreed to kind of let us co-produce, you know, and that's why they went for it. And, and I, I flipped out. I just said, man, we've just had two hit records and now you want to just toss it off, you know, because you, because, because Foster is, you know, too much yeah. of a perfectionist. Right. I mean, he was incredible. You had to be perfect. I mean, nothing's perfect, but you got, you really had to be close. You Fee, really I'm had afraid to try. people are staring daggers at me. I'm keeping you from the, re the the sound check, which is the thing about I tonight. I could talk to you for a long, long time. And it's I such could a talk pity. Forever too. It's such a pity, but it's been a pleasure meeting you. And well, thank great you. show tonight. We're 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 thrilled to be still here playing, and uh, I, you know, I, I've I've. I've, I mean, it was okay with me, you know, to, to go ahead, to, to reach more people and become more mass accepted because I, the reason I'm here, I figured out, not, it's hard to figure out why you're here on the planet. A lot of people never figure it out, but I had a, uh, I had a epiphany and realized that I'm here to create that joy in the people's faces that watch the tubes. That's why I'm here. And I want to keep on doing it. I, you, you, I can't explain to you the feeling that I get when we're up there playing and those people are just going, oh man, you guys are just so weird, you know? <laughs> this is so weird, really great and weird, you know? And that's what, that's what does it for me. That's why I'm still here performing, you know? I mean, I'd just as soon be home playing polo. You know, I love to play polo and I have a couple of horses and I mean, you know, if I could support my polo habit, without doing this, I, you know, but I can't get away from that feeling, that, that joy that comes to me and no, to know that I can do that for them. I can change their life. I can make them happy. I can wash away their cares for two hours. And when I see that coming back to me on the stage, there is no better feeling in the entire world. So, you know, that's why I'm here. Fee, have a great show. Thank you, I will. Show. And thank I you for your time. I had another epiphany that I was gonna, you know, someday when I'm really old, in the middle of White Punks on Dope, I'm gonna have a heart attack and drop dead right on the stage. <laughs> Which I think would be a great way to go because I don't wanna be old and infirm and you know. But not tonight. But not tonight. No. <laughs> I don't figure tonight will be the night. Uh, I took a little bit of ginseng, so I figure <laughs> my heart will probably last me another couple of It's been a pleasure days. meeting you. Well, thank you, I appreciate sure. it. Thank you very much, it's been great. And uh, looking forward to it, okay? all part of the show.
You think so? Oh, I thought that was perfect last night. It felt right with the uh, with the uh, rhythm of the of the sequence. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. Okay, Prairie Tom, one again, please.
picture still, right, with the with everybody? Have you worn that you're not going to see him anyway, are you? This is horrible light. <laughs> you can't see yeah, the Yeah, glasses on, you can't see your dark circles. You know, you're not going to see it on the stage. It's just yeah. Now you look all powdery. Do I? I can't. Oh, here, you don't need to have like that. Guys, don't do things by heart. Oh, what have you done? You only need a little bit. It would be good. <laughs> we see for a second. Oh yeah. Can you look go to this? You got any? What do you got? Black? Black eyeliner? It's <laughs> good. You don't touch my shit. Okay. Bars, baby. That that. Have you do a couple? Cheers. Like okay. So yeah, you've you always been close, like, 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 close,